Hello. I'm Joanne Blay. I'm one of the program officers of the Rockefeller Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our first event of the winter term. It's nice to have you back. We have a great lineup planned this winter. If you're not on our mailing list, just email rockefeller.center at dartmouth.edu and we'll add you to our list so you'll never have to miss any of our events. But if you do miss our events, we usually record and you can find them on our website uh, a day or two after our events. Um, two, uh, just a couple of quick Zoom housekeeping items. At any time during this event, feel free to ask your questions by using the Q&A function. And since we um, met in the fall, Zoom has started offering closed captioning. If you'd like to uh, use the closed captioning, navigate to the live transcript button at the bottom and click on show subtitle. If your screen is narrow, you may have to click on the more button to get there. Um, I would at this moment like to introduce Shadi Mir Varzayan. She's one of our student assistants and she'll be helping us today during the question and answer um, portion of today's event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Lisa Baldes. She is a professor in the Department of Government and also, as well as the Latin American, Lat Latino and Caribbean Studies Department at Dartmouth College. Thank you and welcome. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks to the Rockefeller Center uh, for allowing us to have this, real, this very timely discussion. Um, I'd like to thank Jason Barabbas, the director at Rocky, uh, Sadna Hall, uh, Joanne Blay, uh, Bob Coates, and Laura Hemlock for really excellent uh, support in getting us organized and getting us to this point. So thank you so much. Um, I am delighted to have two really fantastic speakers and scholars um, who are at the forefront of re research on global women's rights here with us today. Uh, Professor Jennifer Piscopo is Associate Professor of Politics at Occidental College. Uh, she's one of the leading scholars on representation, gender quotas, and legislative institutions in Latin America. Her research has appeared in the top journals in political science. She regularly consults for the United Nations Women, uh, think tanks and governments around the world. Jennifer has an impressive travel schedule. Uh, it's worth following on, her on Twitter just to, catch, just to see where she goes. And her most recent article, which appeared in Politics and Gender, analyzes the claim that was made a lot last year that governments or countries governed by women leaders provided more effective COVID responses. And she, her, she did some research that shows that that's a likely spurious uh, correlation. So really interesting research and very timely. Uh, professor uh, Julie Chayu Chuk Suk is Professor of Sociology, Political Science, and Liberal Studies at the Graduate Center at the uh, City University of New York, where she also serves as the Dean for Master's Programs. She is one of the country's top scholars of constitutional gender equality uh, and the author of scores of articles on these issues in the US and in various countries, and as well as globally. Her most recent book came out just last year, and the title of it is We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment, um, really timely in, in, in time for the 100th anniversary of the extension to suffrage of women um, in the United States. Both Professor Piscopo and Professor Souk are frequent commentators in public and social media um, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and the Boston Review. Uh, so they are uh, seasoned practitioners in speaking to topical issues. So I'm going to, the way we'll proceed, I'll have uh, Professor Piscopo speak briefly uh, in answer to the, the issue of today um, Does the US or stand alone uh, in terms of global women's rights and her research as well? Then we'll turn to Professor Sook. Um, I will uh, pose some questions, engage the two of them in a discussion, and then we will open it up uh, for Q&A from all of the participants um, in the last uh, 20, 25 minutes of the talk. So with that, um, I welcome you. Thanks for being here this evening, and I will turn it over to Professor Piscopo. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to uh, Lisa, to Professor Valdez, the team at the Rockefeller Center and Dartmouth College. This is like my dream. Um, conversation and my and the dream people to have it with. So I'm really excited. Um, I made a few notes to start off my comments so I didn't ramble and eat too much of the time. So if you see me glancing down, I'm trying to stay disciplined because I have so much that I really want to say. But we were asked to start off by talking a bit about our research and how it speaks to global women's rights norms and the position of the United States. 
So my research has focused on the adoption and implementation of women's rights, norms, and laws across the globe, but with a focus on political rights. So by norms, I'm really interested in ideas about what women's rights are, and then which countries take these ideas and build policies around them, or even write these ideas into, into constitutions and into laws. So for example, in Latin America, countries long have defined suffrage, probably the most fundamental political right, they've defined suffrage as the right to elect and be elected. So if we take the US perspective, we think about suffrage as the first part, the right to elect or meaning the right to vote. But when other countries articulate this more robust understanding of suffrage as not just a right to elect, but a right to be elected, um, this gives a little bit more breath to the discussion of what political rights are. So the US doesn't incorporate this definition of suffrage into their constitution, but other countries do. So my current project has really been looking at this intellectual history of the idea of a right to be elected, right? Where did this aspect or facet of suffrage come from? So it first appeared in the Spanish constitution of 1812 and then in other constitutions of the 19th century. But in the post-World War II era and in the 1970s with the rise of feminist movements across the globe, the rise of civil rights movements across the globe, this idea or this even legal notion of a right to be elected took on new meaning um, in the context of feminist and civil rights movements. Countries began to become concerned about the absence of certain groups from elected office, like the absence of ethnic minorities in contexts where those ethnic minorities has, had been targeted for genocide or the absence of women. So in places where suffrage was thought about or even legally understood as including a right to be elected, this allowed activists, especially feminist activists, to claim more than simply the underrepresentation of certain groups was unfair, but to claim that the underrepresentation of certain groups violated those groups' political rights, that it was a rights violation to not have certain groups present in office. And so if, if you think that there's something called a right to be elected, when certain groups are absent, it signals that something fishy is going on, that it's not simply just unfair or unjust, but there might be some actual violations of people's political and civil rights. So I've been thinking a lot about this diffusion of the ideas of women's political rights, specifically this notion of women's right to be elected and how it shaped how other countries have taken concrete steps to then get more women elected to political office. And so in the US, we're familiar with initiatives like encouraging more women to run, training programs for women candidates, uh, donating money to women candidates to help them close the fundraising gap. But in many other places, getting more women elected has meant actually adopting laws called gender quota laws that require political parties to run certain percentages of women. And sometimes these gender quota laws attain constitutional standing. They're actually in the constitution. So for instance, there's three Latin American countries right now um, that have in their constitutions that women must comprise half the candidates for all the country's political offices, and also that women must comprise half of all the individuals appointed to office. So you could think about cabinet or the public administration, and those countries are Mexico, Bolivia, and, and Ecuador. So I've done a lot of work on how coalitions of feminists and lawmakers work to pass these laws, pass these kinds of constitutional reforms. Uh, more broadly, there's about 80 countries right now across the globe in every world region that have some kind of gender quota law or constitutional provision. I've looked at how these laws sort of work technically with countries' election systems, whether they're enforced, um, and whether it actually matters to have more women in these appointed and elected positions. And I know we'll talk and get into the details a lot more, so I'll sort of wrap up, but I will say, because um, this question always comes up, you know, it actually really does matter um, that member, women and members of other represented groups are in positions of political authority. So we know from the political science research that when women are present, voters and citizens are more likely to feel that their political system is just, they're more likely to feel that it's legitimate. They're more likely to believe that it's democratic. And we have lots of examples across the globe of how that actually then influences the other kinds of laws and policies that countries make. So that's an overview. I know we'll dig more into the specifics, but it's a little bit of what I do.
Fascinating. Um, thanks, Jen. Uh, let me turn it over to Professor Sook and have her talk about her research. Great. Well, um, uh, Professor Baldes, thank you so much. And thanks to Dartmouth and the Rockefeller Center for convening this event. Um, Professor Baldes mentioned my recently published book, We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and I hope that if you're interested in what's going on right now with the Equal Rights Amendment, because it's come back into public debate um, after many decades of dormancy, um, I hope you'll read the book uh, to learn about what's going on now and why the 100 year history of the amendment uh, matters. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks drawing a little bit on the research I've done, uh, but I'm gonna focus them on the question um, that was posed about uh, whether the United States stands alone and why. With regard to gender equality in constitutions, it is a fact that almost every constitution around the world has a textual provision explicitly guaranteeing the equal rights of women. The United States does not, uh, why not? And one answer to that is that, well, we've tried. Uh, we have tried to get an equal rights amendment. Women have been struggling uh, since, uh, arguably since Seneca Falls in 1848 and before, uh, but formally with regard to actually proposing a constitutional amendment in Congress uh, since 1923, shortly after uh, the 19th amendment on women's suffrage uh, was uh, ratified. Uh, but those efforts have not been successful uh, recently. Uh, and part of the reason that those efforts have not been successful has to do with our entire constitutional regime by which we change the constitution in the United States. Article five of the US constitution requires huge super majorities of both Congress. You need two thirds of both houses and three fourths of the state legislatures to ratify a constitutional amendment. Uh, and there is a real paradox uh, that if you don't have equal status and you don't have equal political status, uh, and in fact, uh, until 1920, women didn't even have the vote, um, how is it that you're going to get these super majorities uh, to move the constitution uh, towards greater inclusion? Uh, and so this of course tells us something about the story of the ERA, how it was introduced, uh, but took 50 years of being reintroduced and tons of hearings uh, before both houses of Congress had two thirds uh, of their composition actually voting uh, for a gender equality amendment. Uh, and then the state legislatures, 35 of them ratified in the 1970s, uh, but you need 38 to make three fourths of the states. Uh, and we didn't get 35 in the 70s and Congress had put a deadline on ratification. Uh, and because of that deadline, which was originally 1979 and then extended once to 1982, uh, the, net, the three additional states never came in. Uh, and then finally, after Trump was elected and after the Women's March, uh, and with record numbers of women elected to state legislatures, three state legislatures came through uh, in uh, between 2017 and January 2020, uh, Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia. So now we do have 38 ratifications, uh, but there's a lot of legal and political contestation as to whether the three late ratifications after the deadline uh, should be counted. Uh, and so to date, uh, the ERA has not been added to the Constitution uh, because Congress imposed that seven year deadline and extended it once. Uh, and uh, last year, the House actually voted to remove the deadline, but the Senate did not follow. Uh, now, because uh, both houses of Congress are controlled uh, by those who support the ERA, mostly Democrats, uh, it's believed that it's possible, although with some barriers, uh, that Congress will remove the deadline even if Congress removes the deadline, uh, there will be continuing contestation uh, in the courts uh, as to whether Congress even has the power uh, to remove uh, the deadline. Uh, the second answer to the question, do we really stand alone though, um, is that actually we don't. Um, we have gender equality in US constitutional law. Uh, it's the gender equality in constitutional law that made the late justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, famous. Uh, and that's the gender equality in US constitutional law. Uh, that's not in a textual provision that we adopted by way of a formal Article V constitutional amendment, uh, but uh, the way that we've made constitutional change. We have, Article V is notorious throughout the world for being one of the most difficult uh, amendment rules. Uh, and the way that Americans have changed the constitution is by acting outside of Article V. That is to say, through litigation uh, and Supreme Court interpretation 
and stretching and expansion of the very abstract concepts that are in our constitution. Our constitution is one of the shortest, most succinct documents in the world. And we leave it to judges uh, to decide what equal protection of the laws means. Uh, and for a long time, equal protection of the laws did not mean equal protection of women. Uh, and it did not mean that gender uh, discrimination was prohibited. Uh, but in the 1970s, because of litigation that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg brought as a lawyer for the ACLU, the idea of equal protection of the laws in the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment was expanded so that now if anyone uh, finds a law that discriminates against women, uh, of course, our Constitution does provide a remedy. Uh, or the laws that, in, that enable the enforcement of our constitution allows people to get such laws uh, struck down. Uh, so in that sense, I argue, of course, uh, in my book that the ERA is unstoppable, not just because someday we might actually get it in the constitution, uh, but we've gotten it into the constitution without formally amending the constitution. It's quietly become part of the constitutional law uh, that we um, enforce uh, but we do stand alone in having an essentially unamendable constitution and, and having our constitutional change occur in this way, which means um, that outside of the legal profession and legal actors, uh, a lot of the work that women have done uh, to change the constitution that we now practice uh, remains un, um, invisible and underappreciated. And if you think about gender inequality uh, and, the, and the idea of women's rights as a solution, uh, to women's work being underappreciated, even though wholly uh, essential to what a democracy does, uh, then that itself is, is of course an argument for remedying uh, the ways in which we do stand alone by not having an actual constitutional guarantee. Great, uh, thanks, Julie. Um, I wanna pick up on that theme of the, to, what ex, to what extent we need an equal rights amendment or we need a constitutional change. And turn it back to Jen to ask you um, about gender quotas and do we need gender quotas in the United States? And if so, what would that look like? Is there a way to kind of think about the advances that have been made in other countries in a way that would fit with the uh, institutional context in the United States? So when I talk about women's representation, right, I often point out that in a lot of the metrics that different international development organizations use to sort of capture the quality of democracy or capture sort of the overall um, inclusiveness of a country, women's representation in parliament, the proportion of women in the parliament or the legislature is usually part of those metrics. So if we were to pull up those metrics on the theme of, of standing alone, right, the US is currently 87 of about 180 countries right? And it's sandwiched in between Lesotho and Armenia. So those are usually not countries with due respect to Lesotho and Armenia that the U.S. thinks of as its peers, right? Um, but the U.S. has about 25% women in Congress, and that's even with the most recent election where record numbers of women ran and won, still only at 25%. And so all those 86 countries ahead of the United States have dramatically more women in Congress. In fact, Rwanda and Bolivia have majority female Congresses. And so they're achieving that through the use of these gender quota laws that I mentioned. So then we get to a really interesting conversation, right, about sort of the constitution and about equality and, uh, you know, uh, whether gender quotas could, could sort of work in the United States. And so I think there's a, a technical answer in relation to elections, and maybe I'll, I'll put that aside for a moment. So I want to pick up on some of the themes that, that Julie highlighted um, about sort of constitution and equality, right? So Julie suggests our constitution has a remedy, right, for discrimination. It's been interpreted, right, through the Supreme Court. And so when women have experienced gender discrimination, if laws and statutes are discriminatory, there's a way to contest. I think that's interesting for gender quotas because the resistance to gender quotas is usually that they are themselves a form of discrimination, right? That they're discriminating in favor of women. You might have heard those terms positive action or affirmative action. And in fact, gender quotas are a form of that, right? And so would that be allowable, right? In a context where you have equal rights or in a context where the constitution, whether 
implied through Supreme Court interpretation, as in the case of the United States, or perhaps articulated in the form of an Equal Rights Amendment, would then say, well, actually, now you can't have gender quotas because that's not equality, right? That actually is giving women an advantage or giving women a favor. What I think is fascinating about that argument is that in other countries where that argument has been tried, in opposition to gender quotas, right? So countries pass gender quota laws and in the vast majority of cases, there have been opponents who have gone to those countries' constitutional courts and said, actually, this violates our constitutional provisions of equality, right? This is discrimination against men and so it violates our constitutional sense of gender equality. In a lot of cases, courts haven't bought that argument, right? And what the courts have, have thought about instead is a distinction between legal equality and substantive equality. And so it might be the case that men and women have legal equality, but that substantively the outcomes for men and women or for other marginalized groups relative to the dominant group are unequal. And so one of the um, court cases I talk about in my work is for instance, the Supreme Court of Costa Rica actually developed this doctrine of what they called compensatory inequalities. And so they said, in the case where a group has experienced a historic injustice, such as in the case of women's exclusion from politics, um, positive discrimination in favor of women is justified because it's attempting to attain a more substantively equal outcome, right? So even if it seems to violate our notions of legal equality, it's okay if it brings us closer to substantive equality, which is a richer understanding of equality. Now, those sorts of arguments are very difficult to make in the US context, I think for historic reasons, especially related to our legacy of enslavement and our um, connection cognitively between affirmative action and um, the black population and its historic exclusion. But what you see is that in other countries, those arguments have sort of worked and in fact, I'll end here, um, several constitutions in Latin America have gone so far as to include this idea of justified unequal treatment if it aims for substantive equality into the way they've written their constitution. That positive discrimination is constitutional when it is aimed at correcting historical injustices. So difficult to think about those arguments in the US, but I like to push the ideas and say, well, what is the limit to our imagination of thinking differently about rights and thinking differently about what rights mean. Wow, thanks. Um, there's so much to think about there. J you know, Julie, it makes me think about something that you've said in well, you've, some of the work that you've done. I think you're making a similar point. And let me, let me ask it and see if this resonates with what Jen just mentioned. Um, you and a group of constitutional law scholars filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief with regard to the Equal Rights Amendment, um, arguing that the ERA's timeliness is a political question for Congress and not a legal question for the courts. And that sounds a, a little bit like the distinction to me, like the distinction between substantive equality and kind of uh, formal legal equality. And I'm wondering if that's at all connected. It's actually not. <laughs> so, um, but Alex, but I want to respond to what Jen said and just clarify some things about the law. So it is true that some constitutional courts, I guess the Costa Rican and uh, in the European context, the most notable example is the Spanish constitutional court. Uh, so in the 80s and 90s, a lot of countries tried to legislate gender quotas. And Jen is right, the opponents started bringing court cases uh, to constitutional courts saying this violates the gender equality clause. Uh, if women and men are equal, then how can we say that we have, we're going to have a certain number of women uh, and a certain number of men and distinguish between men and women in the law? Uh, and it's true that some constitutional courts did what Jen described, but others did not. Uh, they upheld a formal uh, uh, vision of equality uh, to which women responded by amending the constitution. Uh, so in Germany, France, Italy, you get constitutional amendments uh, that then make clear so you get this process uh, by which, and that's how we should also think, I mean, part of the reason the ERA was successful in, in um, 1972 was that the proponents said, we have this equal protection clause, but courts have always rejected gender equality arguments. Uh, and, and one thing that we see in the United States is that right now, uh, people who oppose the ERA aren't against women's rights. It's almost because the ERA was too successful that we didn't end up with an ERA. Uh, because 
Uh, once the Supreme Court started changing in 1971-72 and started recognizing gender equality, it was almost like uh, they were doing the thing that Jen is describing. They were expanding equality by courts. Expanding equality by courts prevents amendment because people start saying, why do we need the amendment if the courts are going to do substantive equality? So it's a very interesting comparison, looking at comparing within the countries that have gender quotas, the ones that got them by the struggle of amending the constitution versus constitutional courts stepping in and saying, it doesn't violate our existing constitution. Uh, but you're absolutely, and there are many different um, ways that this have been do has been done, uh, but I think you're, you're absolutely right that this is something that, that would be a barrier in the United States, largely uh, because we have a lot of equal protection, mostly race cases, uh, that make affirmative action difficult because we have a highly formal understanding of equality under the Equal Protection Clause. Although sometimes, uh, although I don't know that all ERA proponents agree with this argument, uh, but some do. Some say that's precisely why the ERA should be pursued now, because when it was introduced, we didn't have all these Supreme Court decisions starting with Bakke in 1978, which clamped down on race-based affirmative action. Uh, so the proponents in the set early 70s weren't thinking quotas, affirmative action, any of that. Uh, but now uh, there's a lot more attention to it, uh, in part because of global constitutional norms. So some people would say the reason to get an ERA now is to tell the Supreme Court they're getting the affirmative action stuff wrong. Um, they're getting it wrong on race, and they're definitely getting it wrong on gender, and that's what exactly what we want the ERA to mean. Uh, but this just shows that the, the actual language of the Equal Rights Amendment and similar provisions in other constitutions, um, it's also true, as Jen mentioned, that some constitutions that have been drafted in the 20th and 21st centuries operate at a much higher level of specificity. Uh, they're like uh, pages, they're like 80, 90, 100 pages long. Uh, and you know, there you wouldn't be able to put it in your pocket, like pocket US constitutions that we all carry around in our purses. Uh, and so the idea is that we have very general provisions uh, and, uh, and they get interpreted, uh, but they don't have to be interpreted by judges. They can be interpreted by Congress. And one of the th stories that I try to draw out in the book is that the 70s ERA was not just about Supreme Court, you got it wrong, so get it right next time with regard to recognizing gender equality. It was also about women, although there were a very small number, they were vocal, uh, women in the legislatures saying, once we have this amendment, it includes section two, which empowers Congress to enforce. Uh, and so it's going to nudge Congress to adopt public policies and laws that actually promote real equality for women. Uh, and that's why it's necessary. Uh, and what they were saying became true later because the Supreme Court struck down the Violence Against Women Act in 2000 saying that Congress didn't have power uh, under the Commerce Clause uh, and under its power to enforce uh, the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment to actually do something about violence against women on a national scale. So because the Supreme Court has been narrowing Congress's power to adopt national legislation on equality, uh, another thing that the ERA could do if adopted now uh, is give the message to courts that they should have a more expansive and deferential view uh, with regard to Congress's power. And I think that's, that's something that's important now, uh, particularly because, I mean, if you see what's going on with the healthcare case that's before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court in the previous healthcare case said that Congress does not have authority under the Commerce Clause uh, to adopt uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and now we're having like a much narrower fight about uh, whether the tax power reaches one provision of it. Uh, but the point here is that this is a court that has taken in, in favor of straight states rights has taken a very narrow view of what Congress can legislate, particularly around matters that affect um, the private sphere and women uh, and domestic violence in particular. So I do think that the ERA section two and this legislative idea, the idea that you're going to have an ERA that empowers legislators uh, and isn't just about courts interpreting uh, the abstract words uh, is a very important contribution that the ERA could make. And that can be important, not just for women's rights, but uh, American constitutionalism uh, more broadly. And this does relate a little bit now, not on the substantive and formal point um, to the amicus brief that we filed. Um, and. To understand what's going on with the amicus brief, um, basically the states that late ratified the ERA, they basically brought litigation saying we've got 38 ratifications, uh, so the ERA is now part of the constitution. Uh, and that deadline that Congress imposed 
uh, should not should just be ignored because it was unconstitutional. So their theory is that because the Constitution doesn't me mention deadlines, they're not allowed. Um, it's not a an obvious slam dunk winning argument because there are a lot of things that are allowed by the Constitution that are not mentioned in it. Uh, and um, but for us, the real question is: Is this a question that courts should answer or Congress should answer? And there's historical precedent for Congress deciding. When Article Five doesn't say what should happen in the amendment process, should a judge decide or should Congress decide? And when the 14th Amendment was adopted, there were some states that tried to rescind their ratifications, which by the way, has also happened with the ERA and there's controversy about that. But um, when the states uh, tried to rescind, uh, Congress just decided that they were not going to recognize the validity of rescissions and declared the 14th Amendment ratified. And now the question is, um, should courts also have the power to say, you didn't follow the procedures in Article 5, or should Congress say, we made the procedures and we get to decide whether they were followed or not? Um, I think that's a, an important institutional uh, question. Uh, but what we argue in the brief is that it's really, uh, there's, first of all, it's supported by Supreme Court precedent uh, that it's a political question for Congress, uh, whether or not a deadline is, uh, whether or not there's been a reasonable time and whether or not the deadline can be changed. Um, so there's precedent that supports it, but I think just the political theory argument is also very importantly um, relates to what I said earlier. Uh, and the process of constitutional amendment is actually a check on courts and particularly the Supreme Court. We amend the constitution because the Supreme Court has advanced an interpretation of equality uh, that the people have rejected. <laughs> Uh, and so let, me, let me interrupt there and, uh, yeah. on, the, on the checks and balances issue. Congress just voted to impeach President Trump for a second time. What makes women's rights an important issue right now, today, in the context of the pandemic, threats to American democracy, um, and the deep chasms that we are facing um, in, the, in the United States? And keeping in mind that not all women support the Democratic Party. Okay, so that's a two-part question. Why is women's rights so crucial now? And what do you have to say to women who do not support the Democratic Party? Lisa. Oh, and that's for both of you. Okay. Um, right, so we are, we are uh, giving the seminar a moment where, where, history, where history is being made. Uh, I knew this question was coming and one thing I was, because Lisa did share them, um, but one thing I was thinking of is, as Julie was talking, right, because of course in so many of these countries, right, there has been a back and forth between lawmakers and the constitution and constitutional decisions about women's rights and lawmakers going back to the, to the drawing board. And I was thinking, for instance, about the case of, of Colombia and this bridges Lisa's earlier question in this one, right? So in, in Colombia, um, gender quotas were at first declared unconstitutional by the Colombian court. And it was actually because the argument there was that you couldn't um, regulate political parties that were thought to be private entities. So you couldn't tell political parties how many women they needed to run because it was sort of a violation of the privacy of the parties. So a key thing in Colombia was to amend the constitution to change the understanding of political parties. The political parties were in fact public entities who were carrying out the work of democracy. And so if political parties were public entities that were carrying out the work of democracy, um, that they needed to act and behave in ways that were consistent with democracy. And that one of those ways was respecting the principles of gender equality. Now I'm stylizing the arguments a little bit, but that's, that's basically the process, right? And so once they did that, then gender quotas were, were constitutional. But I think going to Lisa's next question, right? Why does this matter right now? is I'm fascinated as well by this idea of political parties as not the same as the Elks Club or the Bowling Association, but as unique groups that have a unique responsibility to behave in ways that are consistent with democratic principles. And when you think about political parties in that way, the things that you can ask political parties to do and the kinds of bad behaviors that you can sanction political parties for gets much larger. And so you see this process happening in a lot of Latin American countries that have been far more aggressive about setting laws and practices for political parties 
and sort of reining in bad behavior on the part of, part of parties. And I think it's really clear in the United States right now that we have one political party in particular that has not demonstrated its commitments to democratic norms. It is not demonstrating its commitments to free and fair elections. So the impeachment is about sanctioning the de facto leader of that political party, right? But there's all sorts of other conversations that are coming up about, well, what do we do with the other members of this party that are continuing to foment these ideas. Um, so why does it matter then to have, have women present when we know that not all women themselves are Democrats? I mean, one of the other talking points I had written down for this was that we do know that a key page in the authoritarian playbook when authoritarians take office, whether these are would-be autocrats, whether these are military generals, whether these are autocrats backed by military generals, is to usually remove women and ethnic and racial minorities from positions of power. Right, so one of the arguments that was made a long time ago um, by feminists, you know, you can't have democracy without women, is tapping into this broader idea that a key move in the autocrat playbook is to remove women from positions of power, right? To reassert a very closed understanding of who holds political power. And so that doesn't mean that every woman in a position of political power is herself a small d Democrat, right? She might be a member of this badly behaving party, but we think that there's bigger problems when women and other racial and ethnic minorities start to disappear from public life because that is itself a sign of the political system becoming more exclusionary and perhaps a sign of the political system becoming more anti-democratic. So we have to continually balance recognizing that women are as diverse in their opinions as men, right? But that the symbolism and the signs of trouble and the signs of democratic health also get attached to women as a group even if individual women vary in their opinions about whether democracy is a good idea. Wow, thank you. Um, Julie, what are your thoughts about women's rights in the present moment? Well, I, it's interesting that we're sitting here uh, in the midst of the impeachment, the second impeachment um, in a very short time. And one thing that's very interesting, which I think is not a coincidence, um, is the role that women um, who have been champions of the ERA uh, including Barbara Jordan and Liz Holtzman, who led the deadline uh, extension in 1978. They were both very active in the House Judiciary uh, Committee's impeachment of Nixon, uh, because I think they saw uh, women's equality as connected up with the problem of abuses of power that come from dangerous imbalances. And that's also an idea that Polly Murray, who's a uh, pioneering civil rights uh, lawyer who uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg credits uh, for many of the ideas that went into the women's rights uh, litigation strategy of the 1970s. Polly Murray, when she testified in favor of the ERA in 1970, talked about the dangerous imbalance, how if you had less than a third women in Congress, um, that was a dangerous imbalance of power that would lead to abuse. And of course, we still have less than a third uh, women in Congress 50 years after uh, she said that. Uh, so I do think that there are problems of abuse of power uh, and not just in Congress, but in many realms of life. And I think that the Me Too movement uh, and debates about gender violence uh, are not just about sex or violence, but, but about abuse of power and the importance of women uh, in leadership positions uh, and gender quotas um, as an antidote uh, to those abuse, like to the conditions that lead uh, to the abuse uh, of power. Uh, and particularly in the COVID moment, um, I think one thing that we've seen, and I think it's part of the dynamic I've been describing about the ERA of um, women doing all this work uh, that's invisible and unrecognized, uh, that benefits everyone, uh, but is uncompensated and invisible and unrecognized and sometimes uh, punished. Uh, and that's to say women, you know, women have been um, terminated from or leaving their jobs uh, at, very, at much higher rates than men. Uh, largely because schools have shut down and they do most of the caregiving at home. Uh, we're in uh, the first female recession uh, of, uh, in American history. Uh, and I think that we're going to need public policy tools for really understanding uh, the gendered economic effects. Uh, and I think that uh, part of the problem with the gendered economic effect is that women, the women are also a very large share of essential workers uh, who are underpaid. Uh, and so I think that the, the dynamics by which um, what women contribute uh, is either invisible or belittled or undervalued um, is itself a form of abuse of power. Uh, and it's by correcting those power imbalances that we uh, can solve some of these problems having to do with the women's rights agenda.
Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to bring Shadi in. Um, Shadi is a Dartmouth 22. Um, she's working with the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy. And um, Shadi, what kind of questions are we getting from the audience? Yeah, let's take a look. Um, so we have a couple of questions right now. And as a reminder, anyone who does have questions, feel free to um, at, uh, contribute through the chat function um, in Zoom. Uh, our first question here, um, says, uh, what country in Latin America do you think is the less equal regarding women in power? Jen, I, I think that's a question for you. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to give one of those sort of hand wavy answers. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, so right now, if we think about Spanish and Portuguese speaking Latin America, there are only um, two countries that don't have a kind of gender quota law for women. And those are uh, Venezuela and Guatemala. Um, so if we were to just look at the measure of which countries um, have gender quota laws, um, the Spanish and Portuguese speaking Latin America is doing very well. Now, some of those countries have laws that work better than others. So um, Costa Rica, Mexico, Bolivia, Ecuador, um, all have very strong uh, gender quota laws. I mentioned that Mexico, Bolivia, and Ecuador were three where uh, gender parity, which is half women and half men, uh, not just among candidates, but among um, all government posts, um, is actually has constitutional standing. And then 10 Latin American countries, um, those four, Mexico, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Ecuador, plus six more, do have gender parity for women um, candidates. So when it comes to sort of thinking about women in formal positions of political power, I mean, I love teaching about Latin America because at least for my students that are more familiar with the US context, um, these Latin American cases really let us challenge some of our pre-existing ideas about what countries do better than others. Of course, there's all sorts of things that we, we have to caveat, right? Of course, many of the women um, that benefit from gender quotas or benefit from other positive action measures that bring more women into office are members of their country's elite classes. Uh, they're not necessarily indigenous or Afro um, descendant, which is of course an important dimension of exclusion. Right, and so we have to really think about equality in these intersectional ways. Um, but if we were to look at just the numbers of vast majority of Latin American countries are doing very well. They all have uh, a form of an equal rights amendment because um, I've tracked that in their constitutions. Um, and 10 countries actually have this kind of positive discrimination permissiveness also in their constitutions. Um, and I see a question came in on, on CEDA and I will, will punt that over to, to Lisa, but I will say that one of the other really important innovations that's happened, not just in Latin America, but elsewhere, um, is countries that give the international treaties on rights that they have signed uh, important presence in their lawmaking. So for instance, in Mexico, key for a lot of women's rights reforms was a decision that was made in Mexico that any international treaty Mexico had signed automatically got constitutional standing. And so Mexico had signed the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And then once that decision was made that that treaty and then any other international treaty Mexico had signed had constitutional standing, it gave activists extra ways to fight for more women's rights policies. Um, so, you know, there's no, the ranking can be done on a variety of metrics, but I would say the region as a whole um, really should draw our attention and really get us to ask some questions about any preconceptions we might have about who's better or worse at advancing women, at least when it comes to legal sense. <laughs> That's a great point. I want to I want to pick up on the mention of CEDA, the uh, UN uh, Treaty on Women's Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. The United States is one of six countries in the world that hasn't ratified um, this treaty, and that was one of the premises behind the impetus for the panel: why the U.S. stands alone with regard to global women's rights. Um, Julie, I'm curious about your perspective on CEDA as a constitutional scholar. Um, I have lots of thoughts about uh, CEDA and whether and the kind of impact it has, but I'm just curious about your views on it um, from the perspective of constitutional law. Well, for the most part, even if we were to actually ratify CEDA, uh, for us, uh, treaties don't aren't self, what we would say are self-executing. Uh, so even if uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting 
uh, in every country also to say that it becomes part of the constitution, which it, it, it wouldn't for us, but let's say that we were, it were to have the same status as something else in our constitution. Um, even the idea that the Bill of Rights is enforceable um, was not obvious. Uh, until we passed a statute that created the mechanisms by which those rights could be enforced in courts. And then there are provisions of the Bill, um, the bill of Rights uh, that are not enforceable um, with regard to states. I mean, so, so it's very complicated what it would mean to have the rights that are in CEDAW, be, even to say that it's part of the Constitution, it's not really clear uh, what that would mean. A lot of it would be left up to a lot of um, filling in uh, by Congress. Uh, but typically, if you had a treaty, uh, Congress would then have to enact a statute. And of course, some people say, why do we need CEDAW? Because Congress has already enacted a lot of statutes on equal pay and non-discrimination uh, with regard to gender. And the states have also uh, enacted various human rights laws and gender equality laws uh, and so forth. Uh, and so I think the conversation does sort of in the legal space uh, look like that. Like, what would it add exactly? Uh, and if it would actually add something that's different from what we already have, uh, why would we do it that way instead of just doing it, right? So there are questions about the legitimacy um, of, uh, of that. And I think it does go to uh, a general sense uh, of um, skepticism uh, about foreign influences uh, in uh, American constitutional law, uh, largely because we have a very positive vist and sovereigntist understanding of what law is uh, and should be. Thanks for that. Um, just one thing I want to say about CEDA that um, Julie has really nicely um, laid out the kind of the main debates about uh, the impact of international human rights treaties within the context of the United States and the US Constitution. Um, there is another aspect of CEDA, and that is that ratifying treaties like CEDA and other human rights treaties does commit the United States and all the countries that ratify it to a regular system or process of reporting on a country's progress toward compliance with that treaty. And one thing the United States does not do is sit down and say, okay, where are we not just on equal rights or on the status of women in legislative office um, or on violence against women, but where are we on all women's rights simultaneously. And that's part of the process of reporting to CEDA that we would actually have be forced to sit down and kind of say and have an, a, a public accounting um, of the overall status of, of women, um, both in a de facto and a de jure sense, um, before the eyes of the world. Uh, and that's something I think has proven to be very, very powerful in terms of, of moving policy and energizing policy communities in other countries. Um, we have a fairly energized policy community on women's rights in the United States, so that's not necessary. Um, but the aspect of really calling the government to account and having a series of standards for calling the government to account, I think would be useful. Um, Shadi, which of the other questions that are out there, what, what looks interesting to you? Yeah, definitely. We have a couple of questions on what a quota system in the US could potentially look like, as well as some of the obstacles to that potentially. Um, one of the questions asks, um, how likely do you think a quota for Senate would work where one seat is always reserved for women or um, on the congressional level where a certain percentage of districts in every state are reserved for women? I think they're maybe drawing a comparison to um, the, in the Indian gender quota. Um, and then also a similar question asks maybe what are, does the US winner take all electoral system perhaps um, impede our ability to adopt a quota system in the first place? Yeah, Lisa asked earlier, you know, about how would a gender quota work in the United States, and I sort of like, you know, hand waved about it. So these questions are, are asking us to be more, more specific, and they really do get into, you know, some of the design um, measures, how do quotas actually work with election systems, right? And so uh, I think that the main challenge to a quota system in the U.S. is actually really not the winner take all um, election system. I'll explain why in a moment, but it's the fact that we have very little legal mechanisms or regulatory mechanisms to control who parties nominate. So, you know, I always explain to my students in most other countries across the globe, parties nominate candidates. It is the party that goes to the election authorities and says, here's my list of candidates that are going to run for the election. But in the U.S., we sort of have this open candidacy system where anyone can declare themselves to be a candidate and they can appropriate a party label, even if they haven't ever been a member or even a supporter of that party in the past. And so when you um, 
put candidate nomination in the hands of parties, it is easy to say to the parties, okay, well, parties, when you present your candidate nominations um, to the election authorities, you have to fill the quota, right? So in other countries that have single member districts or winner take all systems, the gender quota is easy because if the party is say going to field candidates in 300 districts and the quota is 50%, when the parties present their candidate, what we call the candidate registries to the election authorities, they have to show that they're running women in 150 of those districts and 150 of the other districts, right? So the barrier is not that we have a winner take all system, it's that we don't have any mechanism of really controlling who parties nominate because any individual can take a party label and run for office. Um, so, you know, other countries do these reservation systems where they will designate by lottery um, a certain number of districts every year that sort of have to have women candidates. And again, only women are allowed to contest that seat or only women are allowed to contest that district. That's another way to do it. So all of these things are technically possible but you have to have the capacity to make political parties um, follow the rules, right? And so this kind of goes back to my earlier comment about the importance of how do we conceive of political parties? How do we conceive of the kind of work that political parties are doing when political parties carry out the tasks of campaigns and elections? And what sort of behavior do we expect from, from political parties? And so other countries have made the decision that they expect their political parties um, to follow quite a lot more rules about inclusion, not just about women, but also about other groups um, than we do. I, I see a question on the list um, um, from Jason Barabbas. Um, about the way in which uh, transgender rights would be incorporated into the Equal Rights Amendment. And certainly a premise of this panel and of much of policy on regard when we talk about gender issues uh, assumes fixed categories of male and female. Um, what do you think about that, Julie? Um, especially in light of, I, I think there's, um, I'm seeing a lot of legislation coming out of, or at least bills being introduced in Congress, stipulating that gender refers to male and female to make that quite clear, uh, to mitigate against transgender rights having any effect on the Equal Rights Amendment. What are your thoughts on that? So I think this is one of the difficulties of quotas uh, in the United States that we haven't talked about yet. In almost every other country, uh, the equal rights provisions that I've mentioned are actually not, they, so our uh, equal rights amendment uses the language on account of sex, shall not be denied or abridged, equal rights shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Uh, and you could even use the word gender or sex or gender, uh, but in me many of the other countries, Germany, France, uh, equal rights of women and men. Um, and, and I think that's often uh, considered very problematic when I talk to pe uh, people interested in gender equality under the law in the United States, uh, because, uh, and of course, all the parity uh, systems uh, kind of, uh, they, they talk in terms of women and men, male and female. Uh, and so uh, in a context where we want to be more fluid uh, in thinking about gender identity, uh, then I, I think it does become somewhat problematic. Um, in the United States, uh, when the ERA was originally uh, proposed in the 1970s, uh, people weren't really thinking, uh, people were in fact thinking about women and men and not about uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, but I think that's something that's different now. Um, I think the last three ratifications uh, in Nevada, Illinois and Virginia uh, reflect a concern uh, to a much uh, broader understanding of what it means to discriminate uh, on the basis of sex or on the basis of gender. Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, in a decision about Title VII, which is a statute prohibiting, among other things, sex discrimination, expanded its understanding of sex discrimination to include discrimination on the basis of gender identity. The thing is that in the United States, it's very easy to do that if you're primarily concerned with discrimination rather than doing something positive, right? If you're saying discrimination, it's illegal to take someone's gender and identity into account. Uh, and it's very simple. Uh, that's the Bostock decision. If you take gender into account, uh, you're acting illegally, right? It's very hard to do anything positive for underrepresented groups uh, without taking gender into account. Uh, and that's why we have the legal problem conundrum that um, Jen was talking about earlier, uh, that generally the problem you're going to run into every time you try to promote women's rights in this country is that someone is going to say uh, it's gender discriminatory uh, it, because it dis discriminates against men or because it uses a classification that excludes uh, gender nonconforming people. 
Uh, and I think that is a real issue uh, that we need to think about. Uh, but that said, to the extent that you see the Equal Rights Amendment as being most, uh, mostly a negative uh, prohibition of discrimination, there's no reason uh, why it shouldn't include uh, a prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and I think that is the understanding that was advanced when Virginia ratified the ERA with uh, a very powerful speech by a transgender legislator uh, who talked about that. I would just quickly add that, you know, in some of the Latin American cases where I'm more familiar with, of course, discrimination against LGBT groups is, is so profound and serious that there haven't been sort of many cases, but um, so far, it had, at least for gender quotas, it has been the lived identity of the candidate that is counted. Um, so for transgendered individuals who are sort of living, um, living their identity, they get counted as their preferred lived gender identity in that, in that quota. And many Latin American countries actually have been passing quite robust transgendered identity laws that really respect the right of transgendered individuals to have documents, um, to have sort of their other access to healthcare, all on the basis of their lived identity. I think the more serious challenge that we will start to see um, as it becomes easier for candidates of diverse gender identities to be open and then also be candidates will be how non-binary uh, individuals will sort of map onto, onto gender quotas or how individuals who reject a gender category will be able to fit with these legal requirements. Um, but at least in some of the cases where this has been pushed with actual candidacies, uh, the election authorities have been really sensitive to this issue and have really tried to make sure that uh, individuals can still run for office with their preferred identity uh, and with their lived identity. Um, this has been such a fantastic, wide-ranging, and also in-depth conversation um, about the intricacies of constitutional law with regard to uh, gender equality, uh, the prospects and the kind of uh, likely outcomes of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, some of the really exciting, and I say only some, of the really exciting things that have been happening in Latin America. Uh, we didn't talk, we'll have to have another panel just to talk about Chile, Mexico, and Argentina. Um, and I, um, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Um, I do want to thank you all so much uh, for being with us this evening, uh, for giving us your time and attention, uh, for the excellent questions. Um, uh, and to Jen and to Julie uh, for bringing your expertise and uh, your willingness to share it with us on yet another exciting day in the history of the United States. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joanne. Thank you so much. We would be on board for a second panel. So let us know. Um, that was fascinating. It was, it was, it was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, before we close out tonight, which we'll do in just a minute, I did want to mention that um, next week, we have the Rockefeller Center will be hosting two, uh, two events. Um, on next Tuesday, as part of Dartmouth's Martin Luther King celebration, we are hosting uh, Dr. Claiborne Carson from Stanford University, who will be giving a talk entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. King's um, Unanswered Question, Still Unanswered Question. And on Thursday night, also at seven o'clock, we will be hosting a panel discussion entitled, Did the System Work? The Fragile State of American Political Institutions with panelist Matthew Dickinson from Middlebury College and Professor Emerita from Dartmouth, uh, Linda Fowler, and hosted by the Rockefeller Center director, Jason Barabas. Uh, we hope to see you all there. Thank you so much for all coming tonight. We, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Thank you.